Hello, this is Flotilla Friday, Friday, November 19th. And we were just talking about uh, different tools for um, mind mapping and their what are the sort of core things that those tools need to be usable for this new paradigm of finding the right information. And uh, I think Wendy had some other thoughts there. Yeah, so Mark had asked me a good question, which is, you know, what features are so essential that don't exist in the current tools? And I had said, for me, there's kind of three. One is that uh, being able to make new associations between things. So child to child, child to grandchild of, you know, and within a hierarchy, um, being able to edit in the map view so that, you know, whether it's editing the text or moving things around and, and, and changing how they're associated to one another. And then what was the third thing? Does anybody remember? It was top of mind a minute ago. And now I forgot. Yeah, backward and forward bi linking. Bidirectional links. Bidirectional bi links. links, yeah. Um, I feel like there was an, a, a variation on a theme. But anyway, you put all those things together, like people talk about being, a, being able to help me solve one of those, but you put everything together and <laughs> kind of throws, throws it out the window. So, um, so that's, that's what's holding me back. And so I was just talking about how I think maybe prototyping is the way to go and maybe Figma is a good platform for doing that because it seems a little more flexible. Um, and now Vincent's showing the um, Kumu map that I think I've put in like 10 hours to this thing now trying to fit, but this is me learning Airtable too and trying to understand um, the organization of Vincent's data, which just have to say, <laughs> Vincent, going through all the formulas, it told me a lot about where your data is coming in from, like what it looks mm -hmm. like when it comes in and what, you know, the million variations, the formulas you built upon formulas to turn yeah, the know. data from what you had into what you need. Right. And so I was, I was definitely in the weeds. I spent a lot of time in the weeds trying to make sure I wasn't messing something up while I was trying to help it. But certainly oh. in the process, I, I ruined all the connectors. <laughs> and there was a few things that I fixed uh, with the connections. The other like so there's some things that are kumu specific that i added in for example when you go to the press conference like if we go in and we add um let's see um so under the main event mm -hmm. in the description uh we could add let's see um i think if I'm remembering this, yeah, this list category, I think we change it from category to categories. And oh. so if we update that and refresh this. Now there's a bullet point list of all the categories, the sub, the, the children of the main event, where if you hover over those in Kumu, this gives you a way to like, you know, go to presentations or the profiles or the projects or the resources. Um, and yeah, so, yeah. I think I figured out how to finally make the connections in terms of what what Airtable was, what the benefit was of Airtable and how it collapsed, you know, how it syncs up cells so that if you make a change in one place, it makes changes in other places. But yeah. you but then I and then I was able to start copying things over, but I was doing it by hand. You had a meaning I was going in and making the connection and selecting each thing that that the node was going to. Like I had to select them by hand. And I was like, this, especially when it gets to the links or to the presentations of which there are many, this will take me forever. And I know there's a way to copy and paste it, right? That you have done super fast. And I'm like, this should take me five minutes instead of an hour. So I'm stopping. <laughs> yeah, so this is, I did it, I kind of did it, but basically what you would do is uh, like, there's one, basically if you, go to the, I'm like going to delete these. Um, okay. So if you go to the connections table yeah. and then we're talking about presentations. So there's from presentations. Yep. I totally get it. Kumu is here yeah. um, to all these other presentations is linked to. And so yep. what you would then do in Airtable, get away zoom screen. Uh, hold on. Okay. Um, so then Basically, the, you would link to all the presentations yeah. here. Yeah, but now, how do you do it faster? We want to do that manually. So we, we all we need to do is create, so this connection in of itself from presentations to, and yeah. then it's like really long, is one 
record itself. It's one yes. cell in the connections table. So Correct. you go to the elements table. Yeah. And then I could rename this like connections. Um, then we could take this connections thing and we can apply it. We can just copy and paste. Oh, it. you copy it there. And then it makes the link, right? Because then it's saying, oh, in this cell, this two, um, or yeah, it's this actually two. above. It's the it's the row two. Yeah, exactly. It's a link to to everything here. Got it. That was the piece I was missing. I I just couldn't. I knew there was a faster way to do it. And I couldn't figure it out. Um, so anyway, you can see that I created the subcategories under presentations. Right. So now presentations doesn't go directly. The node called presentations doesn't go directly to all the presentations because there were too many. Mm -hmm. Right. It breaks it up. There's five categories, which Jamin, you know, you originally had four topics, I think, when the when the uh, event was launched. But yeah. in the end, he organized it by these five. So I yeah. ignored the four. We created these five. And now the presentations are organized around the five. Cool. And we could use them. I know we also have the five uh, topics as tags and other things as well. So we could start getting a little more nuanced with some of the other information in Kumu so that we could filter by those by those tags. I, I didn't want to connect them because it's going to start to look like a, um, a, a, a weird ball of yarn. Um, but yeah. maybe the topics and the projects could also be under um, under the same tag so that you could filter by different topics. You know, you could filter the information by different topics. I didn't, I also didn't want to do that really without talking to Jamin. Is that how he thinks the information would be valuable, right? Other, so. Yeah. Yay. I cleaned up all the links. There were so many that didn't make sense. Like connect with me was the name of the link. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Or my email was the, is the way the data came through. Right. So I would or I shortened it or I, you know, made sure that it started to make sense. Cool. Yeah, no, it looks great. I think the, um, yeah, the other thing you could do in Kumu is you can filter not only the nodes, but the connections. So you can, if it's a hairball, you can say hide all the connections between certain objects. So like this, the, this button on the bottom lets you say like, show me only the presentations or let me yeah. show me only the projects, but yeah. you could also, um, do the same thing with the connections, I think, where you can hide certain uh, like lines between objects. Mm -hmm. And then I would love to see it in those, in the radial starburst kind of, I know that you said Kumu has some, has some design um, settings where we can, we can, at least tier one could be around a circle, you know, a circular fashion. Yeah. Kind of cool. Let me see if I can log in that way I can edit it. And thank you for teaching me how to fix it for next time too. <laughs> no problem. I learned a lot. So um, Wendy, um, I, I don't want to interrupt, but I, I no, oh, and uh, didn't see that. Uh, Hi, Michael. Bill has his hand up. Go ahead, Bill. All right, this will be quick. So to help, it would help me if there is enough of a group of people who have decided we're going to actually focus on making use of Kumu and Airtable, because I know that, so that then we could, those of us that are doing other things, I mean, I think I could write a Python script to go read an Airtable, but there is another way of taking this information and using it in other, as Mark Antoine might say, other representations. So, um, <laughs> um, anyway, so I, I, I just yeah. want to know if that's true because I have, but if I come in here in another two weeks and use, oh, no, look, I did an entirely different thing using the blah, blah, blah. Right. I'm yeah, so for, it, yeah. You know, so I'm, I'm cut, yeah, I'm cutting you off because I, I think I already know where you're going and, and I kind of have an answer, which is for, for me, the Kumu 
exercise here with Vincent was a good test case for for how does how can how can we use existing technology, existing software to help to facilitate people finding what they're looking for, right? So it really wasn't meant to be the end goal. Kumu wasn't, in my opinion, right? So it was a good test case. One of the things I learned is that we have to massage the data a lot. I think Vincent and I out of this might say, okay, let's how let's stream that line that a bit, but I wouldn't spend an inordinate amount of time on it because at the same time I'm working with Jonathan Sand, Vincent and I are working with Jonathan Sand to build a plugin that's going to be the next, the next level up, in my opinion, on this. So it's another front end. He's going to build um, a plugin for Trove that is, and he's going to build it to the specs specs that Vincent and I want. It's just going to take time. You know, it's going to take months. So as we're working on that, I'm, you know, Kumu was kind of a step in the direction that taught us a bit about how we need to organize the data to get it to do what we want it to do. Um, that for me, that's what it, that's what it did for me. I can let Vincent speak to that piece. Um, but I'm much more interested in what we can do with Jonathan Sand, who has a, a front end interface already for mapping knowledge that he calls seriously. And we're going to take the learning and the expertise that he's done there and put it towards a, a building a plugin that can be used on top of Trove. So that I think will have much more ability to give us what we want long term. So to be to be continued kind of thing, you know, if we have once we have something to show, then um, I think that will be more exciting in the long term. Um. Wendy, you said something that fascinated me, which was about different kinds of relationships within sort of what I'm visualizing at the moment, mm -hmm. that sort of network mind map diagram that we just saw in Kumu. Mm -hmm. And that's a fascinating um, idea and I've never seen that implemented and I'm I, I'm not I'm I'm not sure what to do with that idea um, I'm not sure what that looks like I'm not sure I mean it's it seems interesting and powerful but I'm I'm not able to apply it in, yeah. in a sense can that's you give some fair. examples or yeah that's fair I uh, for me it's I think that's why I'm so eager and and yet at the same time, you know, hitting roadblocks in creating what it is that I'm visualizing in my head and how it could apply because it's um yeah, it's it's because it's got some sticky spots for sure from a technical perspective. So and Kumu is so let me take it from Kumu, right? And then say what I wish it could do. How about that? Okay. All right, so Kumu, first of all, there's I think we, there's been recognition in the in the conversations that we've had in many in many of the venues, whether it's OGM or here or other places, that the hairball doesn't work in the sense that people can't understand it, right? And something that's that in a lot of the tools we have now are not dynamic enough and don't provide some of the other features I was describing before. So there's something something we need in between. Here's my vision of that. Take Kumu what we just showed you on Kumu and let me navigate, like follow. So let's say, oh, yep, I'm interested in um, the press conference event. I know that's true, right? So I browse on Trove, then I go to a map view of the browsing results. I've come to the center of the event itself. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good idea. Come to the center of the event itself. Now, I, now, if it's organized in a way, and for me, organization could either be collapsed all, I'm trying to use my hands, like collapsed all to one side, or it could be radial. It depends that those, the, the decision on that design would depend on how many pieces of information we're talking about, whether I have editing capabilities of collapsing things or expanding things, or in terms of editing the view. Um, and so with all those things already figured out, whatever that solution is, right? I get to something that I can actually take a look at. Oh, okay, so now I go, okay, there's all this stuff. I'm not interested in the people right now. What I really wanna understand is what happened, like what it got talked about, right? So I wanna know what the presentations are. So I'm gonna to go to presentations, which I think is at the lower end. Yep, 
So I could have just clicked on presentations and then the other stuff tends to disappear like Kumu does a pretty good job with that, but let's say it looks more like this, right? So now the parent became the child. So in the sense that the press conference is now in the outer ring and presentations is in the focus. Ideally, I would like to see two levels of information because I, for me, one level is not enough, right? So presentations, now I can see where, thank you, Vincent. I appreciate the, uh, the <laughs> out there. So now I can see kind of, oh, I see the topics. I instantly can see here, are the topics that were talked about here, here's generally what happened. So I'm gonna start searching now because I'm already pretty much in the place I wanna be. And now I'm gonna click on a presentation that I think is interesting, right? Um, sure, anyone. Right. So and then and now it's giving me a little card that tells me a little bit about it. Now I can go where I want from there. Ideally, I would be able to center on the presentation and the presentation. Hope ideally, again, this is where Kumu starts to not work for me because um, it just it, it's it it's very manual to make all these connections. Um, these are the cross connections. Right. So ideally, I would get to the presentation and then it would link just as easily for me just put the presentation in the center and now link out to associated other links, the organization that this presentation is coming from or talking about, the person that presented it so that I could see their profile, um, anything else, like any, you know, topics of conversation from past events. Um, it could be anything that's related to this particular presentation curated by the, by the group, curated by the people. Yeah, you have a question. If I can check for understanding in this replay, what I think you said in my own words. Sure. Mm -hmm. So every categorization, whether it be a presentation or a person is linked to many other people, many other presentations. There's these many to many links. And what you want to do is be able to not have all of these links shown, and I love the hairball image. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but to say, aha, now that I have found the node of interest, mm -hmm. I want to um, ask this node, what are all of your particular links to anything that you're linked to and hide all the rest of it so I can focus on the entity that is um, the entity of, of, of current focus. Um, now, if I want to say, aha, I see all the um, first order links to every type of thing that this entity say a actual presentation is linked to then aha i see it's linked to jamin okay what are the people that jamin are, are linked with what are the projects that jamin is linked with what are the so it's it's a um, kind of a multi-dimensional traversal um where you can very easily see the dimensions and add dimensions and remove dimensions as needed. Yes. So, and, and yet still all of that we just were talking about is just mapping existing knowledge in a way that I think is more navigable. I love saying that word. Okay. <laughs> so more, you can um, navigate better uh, to find what you're looking for. This isn't yet editing, collaborating. Right now we're getting into the really interesting stuff, right? I'm just, we're talking, like, I just want to get baseline in, which is we can navigate knowledge to get to what we're interested in knowing and even hopefully kind of spread it out to your point. I think you were using good phrases there of like, now, now that I have my area of interest, I want to be able to kind of filter it or see the parts that are important to me, um, kind of work on it from that standpoint. So here's for me where the editing capabilities come in. Wait a minute, these don't things, these don't, these things should be, you know, this should be the grandchild and there's a, there's a child that should be in between the parent or the center and two out, right? Like, let's move that. Or these two things actually connect too, because this presentation went with this event as well. So let me make that connection while I'm here, right? So that we can follow our own train of thought. This, for me, all of it's going towards not so much the importance of how we map data as how we're thinking, 
I want to be able to enable people to follow the train of thing. I want to put a note here that's just now we're getting, now we go, okay, this is the public version, at least for this group, or at least on Trove. Now, what about my own private version of this? right? I want to curate something that's just me. I don't care about this event or that event. I care about the topic, right? And so for me, I'm going to curate that topic to my own personal tree, save it, favorite it. I have a whole system for that, right? Like you just, so that I have my own personal version of things. It's kind of like my own future watch list, except that, right? Or, and it's, and it's a little bit about factor, now, what about a whole layer of stuff of where we can add things in, right? So there's a stream of stuff or it's, or it's offering me suggestions or links to new, new things that no one's thought about based on topic or based on person or based on t tags. I mean, it goes and goes and goes and goes. Um, Sign me up. Okay. The... Uh... Everybody else is silent, so I think I'll go. The, there's a simple enough UX way of doing some of this. Uh, it's whenever you're even, I hate bubbles and arrows, as I've said many times, but there's still ways to do it better than what's been done. And it's that we have to not always think of the focus as the selection. So if you select a node, it's the focus, it's the selection at one point. So you look at its immediate neighborhood. Then you select the next node that becomes the new focus, the oldest kind of old focus. And we could have a system where we kind of, you know, keep a trail of past focuses and two, three past focuses. And actually the real next step is to lock. So, you know, I care about this one have a little lock icon. It's not visual lock, but it's a, I want this one to stay on the screen no matter where else I navigate because I'm looking at how any other thing I navigate to relates to that one. And then where it gets really interesting is you can do a kind of calculation. You could even have kind of lock weights, right? Multiple nodes could be locked. And this one is locked heavily. So I'm looking at its layer two neighborhood as opposed to just its layer one neighborhood. And then you could say, if, think of propagation of weight, right? This thing is distance two from the lock. So it's, it's got a, a small weight that's not high enough for it to show. But if it's distance two from two lock nodes, <laughs> it will show. Uh, and, and, and you can do these kind of weight propagation techniques. And anything that is in the intersection of selected nodes, plural, is relevant and in view. It's not, that's not rocket science. No, I love that too. Yeah, I was thinking about it more in the sense of having control over easily expanding and contracting certain, certain branches and certain sections of branches so that I could bring into view but I like your solution better, <laughs> weighting things so that I can, I don't have to worry about expanding and contracting. I can just click on other things that are interesting and without losing. Without losing context. Yeah. Because what you're doing is you're, you're creating a curated view out of the grand view. And creating yes. a curated <laughs> view is selecting and, yeah. and weighing the important uh, topical notes. Yeah. Thank you. That's brilliant. I have no idea when that'll fit in, <laughs> when, <laughs> yeah, the emphasis That's, there, but I'm writing it down. It UX is all that burner for me. I'm so looking forward to having the data structures I want <laughs> so yes. I can bloody get to UX. <laughs> well, and, and I get, right. So I keep going, do I wait? And I, I, lately my answer has been no. I think it's important that I, and, and this conversation helps no, no. to put, emphasis it, it, on how important no, it is your emphasis to get is UX visual. and that's fine I mean we don't have to we, we each have to pursue our respective dreams <laughs> yeah but sometimes the dream comes faster ironically when we wait for the next step right yeah. to to be in place and so it's for me it's about listening to what's emerging and and knowing when to take the next step forward um yeah. and so um, lately, I've just been thinking, you know, if at least I could create a prototype, then these conversations could be augmented, not just by Kumu, but by a vision of what I, you know, what I think is possible, which we're talking about, 
but still I think it would help people if they could see it. And then they could say, wait a minute, no, the tech for this part exists. It's just way over here in a corner. No one's doing anything with it, right? It would start to bring out hopefully some, some other pieces um, and help shape, you know, give it some more shape. But I don't know, that's just a hope. Well, I gotta leave very soon. I just came from the Future of Text conference and uh, one of the people has reinvented HyperCard and everybody's like, great, this is great. You know, we need HyperCard. <laughs> And uh, HyperCard is still relevant. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is. Um, it but, was it uh, just we invented it, and where where do we see it? Um, sure. We all want it. Um, basically, uh, there's a recording. Um, uh, I will have to dig it up. Um, I have it in my notes, but I just have to run. Um, so, um, gosh, thank you. Wish I could stay and. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Wendy and Mark. And uh, thank, thank you for allowing and, me to riff on my dreams. Uh, I certainly, uh, you know, the more you, the more you talk, the more I want to get um, a Claudia Brenner involved. But um, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of I look. This is one of my favorite um, lines for this year. We all want to. We all want community. We all want to work together, but people. Um, you know, we're, we're limited by time and that's fine. Um, I gotta go write code, so thanks. Thanks, Mark. Bye-bye. Probably same, sorry I arrived late. I just lost track of time a bit. I was tired after the seminar this morning. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm glad you're here. It's nice to get your input. Yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at. Anybody so else? I'm, I'm curious when you say you have somebody uh, going who's going to write your specs that's great uh, what's do you have more on your specs rather than what you just said I have been writing down features and specs for a couple of years okay. um, at first it was just drawings and the idea kept morphing and for a lab about the last year year and a half, the idea really hasn't changed very much. It's okay. been iterating the specs of it and trying to, trying to, you know, put it down in different ways. So I've written it in summary forms. I've written it in, you know, in detailed Excel spreadsheets about like, if you click, this is this thing, this is what happens. If you double click this thing, this is what happens. If you, right. I'm trying to get down to all the nitty gritties. Um, I've, I've done, you know, I've drawn from many different things that are out there already and put together documents that say, I like the features from this and I like the features from that. I like, so it's all teed up. Like I'm teed up to do the prototype. I just haven't done the prototype yet. Yeah, that's very much like me, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that how your work feels sometimes too? Oh, yes. Yeah. Anyway. Bill well, I, I just wanted to say, Mark, I'm sorry I had to leave early. I really appreciated what I saw. This, Good. this morning, uh, I mean, I really want to see more, but I think the thing that struck me, Wendy, when you were talking about this, uh, the visual and zooming around in Kumu and stuff, I, mm -hmm. for me, these like connected graphs can easily overwhelm mm -hmm. my capacity to even uh, to know what to do. And then when you were talking about, you know, you highlight this and the other things move off to the side. And there is something, you talked about two things. One was collaborating. Mm -hmm. So the issue I brought up in the chat, but I'd like to hear what you had to say. How do we deal with the fact that, hey, I've drawn a connected graph among these things, which is a lot different than the one you do it, you know? So now what, now, now what do we have? Except maybe, you know, let's go have tea and talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, so, and then, so there is this thing about thinking. And then when, when you, I heard the last talk, I was, because I've been reading some pretty detailed history books and stuff. And so when I'm reading and I'm, I make an underline and make a note about something on a page. I mean, there's a way that I keep things in mind that I didn't think see was reflected in what you talked about in terms of using the that was maybe, maybe i don't the, yeah maybe i don't really 
Oh, let me, I, let me see for me, when I say like keeping in mind while I'm reading this book, yeah, there's something that kind of happens. I mean, you know, it's like uh, I'm an organism. It just happens. Right. Yeah. So yeah. maybe that's it. I'm just a little. Yeah. And, and, and here's what I'm dreaming of, you know, for the far future, right? It's, I think a good analogy would be as the world became smaller in the sense that people traveled more understand and before gps we all under, needed to figure out how to understand maps right just to get to where we were going and there were some pretty stand there became some standards for how we read those maps how we get to you know how we understand the key how we understand the the structure of the map the colors of the map generally right so I do think that there is an element for sure in here of educating people to use it. The goal, however, would not be about better representing the data. The goal would be about helping people navigate the data so that the goal would be continually removing friction for people to use this new kind of map. That doesn't mean though that the map itself couldn't connect to you know, we get to a topic and you like to represent that topic through one kind of, you know, graph. And I like to represent it with like a mind map and someone else wants to represent it with notes. And some that all could be then linked. That does, the content does not need to be figured out for this map to work. It'll be almost like saying you need to figure out what the buildings look like before you can map them, or you need to figure out what the what's inside the buildings in order to be able to map them. I'm just trying to figure out the map. Then where you end up is totally up to you, right? And how you wanna represent it then can become up to you. In fact, what you do, your map might be better than mine, right? That I posted. So you end up linking, it becomes a node. And it's just a link to the map that you offer to the world. And everyone thinks that's one's better. So now we're getting into a land of like crowdsourcing which which buildings show up, which, you know, which signposts show up, which resources show up um, that people generally find most useful. Or I put on filters that kind of filter the whole public network for me to say, because I generally like visual things, or I generally like things that are that are, you know, that are that are video instead of textual or whatever, right? So we can start to apply those so that I get things that are most useful to me. Did that well first I just want to see did, was I on the right path bill did that is that kind of what you were talking about okay 1000 percent on this I mean being able to link entities across systems is a key goal for me because we need to be able to like I've made it a spreadsheet you've made it a graph we need to be able to talk about this thing over there. <laughs> and, and, and there's part of that, which I'm trying to solve in hyperknowledge is common naming and how to make the names carry across systems. And I keep harping on equivalence classes and this kind of stuff. But if we're doing to, going to do at the UX level, there's so much more that's needed, right? It's being able, when I speak about one thing I learned when I worked on Cheops is how important it is for the feeling of manipulating a real object that, that the notion of, oh, I'm selecting this thing. It has to be selected in all the tools so that I know it's the same object. I'm hovering over this thing. Well, there's a kind of hover outline, which I should see in all the tools for the same reason. And, uh, oh, the neighborhood lights up. Well, the neighborhood should light up everywhere, <laughs> right? And, 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 and if we have different neighborhood, this is where it gets really interesting because then I get to compare how you've created the neighborhood with how I've created the neighborhood and, and how the neighborhoods match or don't match and what are the missing links. Right, but, but you, but, it, it sounds like you instantly understand at least you're both talking about neighborhoods. Yes. Or at least, right. Because they're being presented in the same way, even though the content is different. Yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, and, and, but that, but that means exactly that you have to have this notion of I'm selecting, pre-selecting, highlighting. Uh, there, it could be a filtered view. You know, filtered search. 
all of these concepts, which are pretty high level UX concepts, ideally should be shared across views so that something that happens in one view can be propagated across views. So you see, oh, this is this, what looks like a neighborhood here is very dispersed topology in that other view. And I need to know that because this other view connects things in a different way. <laughs> but this is, this is such a demanding UX yeah. um, ask. Yeah. I, I, I really appreciate you bringing this part up because you're articulating something that's just been like a, a level of frustration for me and trying to describe it to people because people are like, why don't you just draw it? I'm like, it's useless. Like it, <laughs> just drawing it on paper does not communicate the complexity that we need to start figuring out and solving for. And, and, and for me, Cheops was, was that because there was so much of Cheops that's just interaction and animation that conveys structure in a way that the static image of Cheops doesn't. And uh, getting people to understand the dynamic relationship between uh, structural elements, you can do it with specialized animation. Now that's it, all that said, there's this very high demanding ask, as I said, of getting all these high level uh, topologies across tools. But in a way it's topology is pretty well understood concept and maybe that's all we're asking for. And the other ask, which is in some ways easier, in some ways harder, it's to say, okay, let me take this structure, which I have in this tool, this structure, which you have in this tool, and let's translate your structure and your tool into my tool so I can see it side by side. And here we're not looking at corresponding objects. We're just saying, okay, I've made this copy, and now I can compare within one tool, within one visualization modality, and it may be easier to draw the parallels and you know link. Oh, this is the same node. This is the same link. This is the same thing, uh, because you're within the modality, and, and, and you can have a modality that's specialized for uh, structure matching, right? Ideally, again, and then you could ideally round trip. Or not, <laughs> uh, because, but 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 I mean, round trip is technically hard. Shared topology is technically hard. Import is a usually well better defined problem. But still, I do I so wish uh, we had modular UX elements with which could understand the notion that hey, I'm getting this topology for elsewhere, and I need to highlight that somehow. That is that is a big ask, but I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry, uh, ranting. <laughs> no, it's it's great. And this is where I think we need to start finding ways to express and design visually for people to understand that this is where these things can go. Because I think it informs so much about the data, like how the data needs to be organized is, is, yep. is everyone's running into, right? And, and how, you know, and I know that's what you're working on, right? And this is the frustration. It's like get, working at these very high levels of, of design and UX and thinking about the person and how they're going to interact with it at the same time that we're trying to understand the data structures, their limitations towards all those things that eventually will become user experience. And, and really the, the web world has not done a very good job of this for all this time, right? Of merging these two things. You know, you kind of get the user experience you get because the data is what it is to a large degree. Um, and, totally. and, and we're trying to break that <laughs> and it's good, but it's really hard. It is, it is. And no one wants to. Like I was like, no, oh, of course not. hard. I don't wanna do that. Can we just do it in boxes? No, we can't. <laughs> Ruins the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but also, I mean, my th this is your frustration, and my frustration is well, no, and also no one wants to do the hard work of a good data structure that addresses this. I do. I know. <laughs> I can't actually do it though. That's my problem. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't offer much for as as in terms of help except conversation. Um, I live in more the design side of things, so. Yeah, I was thinking about starting to play around with Figma myself and just see if I can learn that system and start to throw some stuff down. It's 
to pipe up. I, I, I really do think that that um, <clears throat> the the sense in which the same information is viewed in different structures, whether it's on different platforms or within one platform, you know, the ability to say, oh, I want, you know, I want the list, I want the, the spreadsheet, I want the map, I want A critical thing. What's been your experience with that and factor? Because you have so many different types of resources always coming into factor and, and it seems to me like it just treats it kind of maybe the way that that Facebook might, right? Where it's it's not necessarily highlighting, but maybe I I haven't appreciated some finer points of factor. And have you learned something from from that experience? Well, one thing that we've tried to do that's been a learning experience is let every um, item of knowledge, you know, just item on the platform um, be uh, describable, you know, ha have metadata that says, you know, this is a link, this is an image, this is a post, this is a that, you know, just let all those things be treated kind of equally and let people tag them so that you can say, I wanna see, you know, we're, we're, we're much less about the mapping rather as opposed to the, the sort of filtering and, um, and, and grouping of things by criteria. Say, you know, I wanna see all the things from this person that are, in this format that are from this time period that are, you know, just have, have possibilities for, um, for filtering and recombinance um, to maybe coin a word. No, nah, that's not, that's a, that's a word. Um, um, just, you know, there, there are times when you want to limit things in ways that, um, that wouldn't necessarily be apparent. And it would be great to be able to do that in a map view too, which we don't have. Um, you know, we just have, um, you know, the list, the card, the, the single image. Um, we do have as a shadow feature that isn't currently available, but we have um, had as the geographic map, um, but not the concept map um, and, you know, not the grid. Um, but, you know, all, all those things I think are, are super, super important. Yeah. And still your learnings are essential, right? Part of the conversation too, because it forms the, it informs the data, which informs whether you're viewing it in streams, which is wh what you guys are doing now, right? Or whether you're viewing it in a map view, these conversations need to happen about how to organize large amounts of, of nodes, essentially. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, Mark Antoine, I just saw the, the note that you wrote in the chat. Um, so the, the multiple views, yeah, I, I hear it should, you. it should be a mosaic, um, right? It's, it's the, the, what I find sad, and I've done it, right? When I was working on Chi Ups, we'd like, oh yeah, let's expand it multi-view and multi-graph views. And we were visualizing graphs and trees and let's make it multi-paradigm. And we went into the same trap. Let's build all the views ourselves. It's so much work. <laughs> uh, yeah. and, and maybe I'm pipe, dream pipe dreaming about reusable views, but it seems to me there should be a way to expose, here's my data structure, here's the view, and please uh, let's plug these together. And so that right. many people can offer views and many people can offer specialized views with the underlying data structure. Yeah, agreed. And, and I, I think that, that the, you know, there, there are things that there, you know, um, Wendy, I think, you know, your vision is much more map centric um, and and it's not like I think, oh, you know, factor should be built to accommodate that and have the alternative, you know, there and any map view we would do would be much more elementary, you know, um, view of the same 
stuff. I mean, it would essentially be, you know, here are the things that are tagged this. The connection between cards and not connection between concepts within the cards, for example. Right, I'm much, right. I, I tend to be yeah. much more fine grained. But that what I'm saying is in a way that shouldn't matter. In, in a way that should also be customizable. If, if I had a graph view widget, I should be able to say, OK, here's the data. It's cards and links between cards. Oh, here's the data. It's concepts and uh, clusters of concepts and cards and links between concepts. These are two data sets that I should be able to throw at a graph view widget and get a view either way. I should have, uh, here is the translation layer that takes whatever data you have. Okay, we're speaking about the factor data. And I want to see it as a graph. I want to yeah. see it as a table. I want to see it as, you know, and there can be multiple ways to uh, wrangle the factor data into a graph. That means there's many adapters. The widget, the, the, the graph display widget should not care about that. It should yeah. be able to say, I'm displaying nodes and okay, tell, just tell me what the title, what's the title I should paint and I'll paint it. <laughs> the, the, on the other hand, the, that said, I mean, in terms of lessons learned, my, my lessons learned with Giza and databases, when you have a massive knowledge graph, global views are bloody expensive. Uh, it's easy to make local views. And why do people make local views? Because local views are fast enough. And the moment you go into global views, your system shatters. I mean, the amount of time I spent optimizing in Idealoom, the little number that shows, oh, there's so many unread messages under this idea, because it's a fairly complex calculation, because it's a uh, uh, tree then relation, then tree, <laughs> uh, recursive descent. So it's it's optimizing that. I did it. It's pretty snappy, but it was a ridiculous number of man hours of saying, here's that specific data structure that I want to give a synthetic information about. And synthetic information is costly. Uh, that That's specific to Idealoom. But I think in general, uh, you know, we, they keep saying the, the two hard problems in computer science are naming and caching. Uh, having complex synthetic global views requires a lot of caching. And that's where we're a bit beyond the abstract generic widget level. But still, I think solving the abstract generic widget problem with a translation layer remains relevant. Being able to say use something like um, under uh, either underlay, but the other one, um, Cambrian, uh, to say I'm throwing whatever at a graph visual widget, and each of my views is able to understand the various manipulation operations in any view, so that I can reflect selection, pre-selection, blah, 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 across widgets. But it's it's a different problem. And, and as I, so yeah. is the problem that you're talking about, Mark Antoine, and like, I mean, this is like, I feel like something that just, I come back to constantly is that like visualizations, like to put something on a map, there needs to be an address field that is correctly formatted um, and that doesn't have like some of them as a lat longitude coordinates and other of them as um, right, like uh, just an address and other ones, it's just like a city and they have to be like yeah. spelled right, um, right? And so like, if you don't have the right data structure, then having that, then importing someone else's data from a graph tool into a map tool where they didn't think about putting it on a map tool. And so they didn't put any sort of forethought into the data structure. Um, when I try to import that, it's lossy because I can't put it on into a new view without like spending lots of time manually curating the information. Or, 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 or finding a library that does some of that for you. No, no, that's that's part of the problem. It's absolutely true. But let me let me tell you what I'm thinking about more up to a point. That's true, that's accurate. But for example, in my contact address book, 
each person has multiple addresses, right? So if I want to show people, there's a kind of uh, non-isomorphic uh, uh, relation between people and addresses. Uh, and if I'm going to display people on a map view, what do I want? Uh, okay, well, there's a view where I want all the work addresses, supposing those have been accurately labeled. And there's a view where I want both the home and the work or just the home. And those are different. And that's a simple case, right? Uh, I, I think the example of factor was really good. There is a perfectly valid bubbles and arrows view that looks at factor cards and relations, explicit relations. And there's a totally different views that looks that decomposes the text, extracts concepts, look at the links between the concepts that through textual analysis, and then gives you a, here are the concept in this set of factor uh, cards. And yet I want to show how they're clustered in the cards. That's a high level of abstraction. When you're telling your uh, map widget that, here I have not only nodes, but clusters of nodes. And I want you to give me a good visualization of that. But what I'm saying is this is a choice. I can have the clustering of concept, uh, the, the concepts on cluster, concepts clustered by card, or just cards. Those are three valid bubbles and arrow views on factor data. And that should be, uh, you know, a kind of little Lego adapter block I put between my data the database and the widget. And it's not just that it's a different format, it's a different, totally different way of decomposing the information is what I'm trying to say. And when you're dealing with information that is structured and decomposable, it really matter how, how will you, it's, it not, it's the impedance mismatch, not between data formats, but between structure topology that I'm saying is a hard but really great problem to, would be a great problem to solve. So, so go ahead, Wendy. Okay. So where my mind goes with this is we, we've been talking about how to structure the data so that it gets represented properly, right? I'm just going to repeat for a second. And if <laughs> is represented in one way here, but represented in another way there. Like we're going from a graph to a map or something like that, right? And we try to export the data here and import it in here. And now it doesn't work because the data is not structured properly to, to, to work in a map view. It's, for me, I instantly go to, it's not about the data. It's about, that's where we're freed up. I mean, it is to start, but then we're freed up if the map itself is editable. Because then when it doesn't come through quite right, I'm not going back to the data source to try and fix it. I'm fixing it in the map view itself, right? So there's a certain amount of work that we don't want to repeat in, in human knowledge here, right? But then there's, a, there's other stuff that can get created that cannot necessarily be seen in terms of its interrelationship in the data structure. We need to see it in a visual view for some of us. Right, need to see it in a visual view in order to really understand how the information is interlinked. So it's both, I guess, is what I'm saying. And I don't want to let, I don't want to miss out on the richness of how people can add if they're given an interface that really helps them interact with the data in this kind of visual way that we tend to be as humans, visual thinkers, that we can start to create these associations. It doesn't necessarily need to come from somewhere else in a database. Does that make sense? I can't wait to hear what you're going to say. Yes and no. Uh, I, I, on the one hand, yes, absolutely. On the other hand, then the problem is you've done the edit in your translated view. And if it's a correction to the original data, it will be lost in the original data. And then someone else will have to do it and someone else will have to do it and someone else will have Why? to do it for each Can translation. Help me That's a key point for me to help to appreciate. Why would it not be a change to the database? What you, well, it's, it may be that I misheard what you said, but you said, I want to edit the map, which means I assume you meant edit at the map data level, you know, which has been translated. The, okay. Tr 
Putting well, data from one structure to the other is fairly easy. The problem is when you want to do round trip and sync so that the edits in the translated data back port to the original data. That's technically harder. Not saying well, then it's you're impossible. Asking, like, what's the original data? I mean, yeah, if we're talking about the uh, internet of everything, like. I agree totally. I agree totally. Now we're talking but, blockchain, hollow chain, like who owns it? Where does it sit? Where, you know, where's the original? But, but, but we're still, we're still speaking of having had one data in one format and then, okay, I wanted to put it in the new vid widget. So I put a translation layer so that it, it gets shown in a way that's intelligible to that widget. And now I'm doing editing in that widget. And the question is, does the translation layer, is it bidirectional? Which again can be done. It's data lensing. It's just harder. And this is this is Cambrian does that. It's really fascinating and really hard. Uh, but yes, it's it's what I'm saying is this is the non-trivial part. But I agree. I agree. It's it's good if you're able to edit in the destination widget and somehow it gets trans back translated to oh by the way this is an edit request. And then again, of course, if the data is owned, because sometimes it is, not it shouldn't always be, but sometimes it is, then that data needs to be validated. And now can you have kind of two versions, your forked version of the data with your edits <laughs> and uh, the original version and blah, 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 and, and, and understanding yeah. the... Mm -hmm. But that's, it's all, it's all doable, but my goodness, it's, we're it's all... A lot. Yeah, and this is where working with Jonathan Sand on on his stuff is really interesting because he doesn't have the um, global versus local thing. It's just local, right? But um, a lot, some of these other nuances he has figured out, which is all the edits happen through the map view. Well, right, it's cho he's choosing a side there too, right? All the edits happen in a map view. And so um, yeah, which... it'll be interesting to see how 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 yep. it plays out, yep. A, an interesting idea, like I was thinking about recently has been, uh, well, let me let Michael back in. Um, oh good, I'm glad he's back. Like order of operations in math, like PEMDAS is like, right? Like what you do first. So I um, was talking with Jonathan this week about um, kind of the uh, stacking, of different, um, oh, what was the word? Uh, like basically when you have like an order of like preference of what information to show. And so like in the case of Trove, it's like, okay, if this event has an image, show it. If there's no image and it has a network, show that network image. If there's no image and no network image, then show the group image. If there's no group image, then show a stock photo if there's no stock photo show a color. And so there's like an order of operations. And I'm wondering, yeah, like for like the forking and editing of um, information, if there can be some rule of doing a similar sort of thing where like, let's say there's like a hundred versions of the same page, if there can be like an order of operations that somehow s programmatically shows the one, like, you know, the kind of main one as a generated version from lots of other ones based off of some order of operations. Like, okay, if page number 83 had the most views in the last month, we're going to show that one in this order, or we're going to show part of this one. It's, it's probably more difficult with like a wiki, but something where it's like a database and there's different information that's conflicting, it might be able to like, um, solve that problem in interesting ways. Yes. Yeah, and I was seeing too an opportunity again for uh, people to engage with it and say, I like this description if you make this one change to it. Right now we're getting into like real collaborative stuff, right? Or nope, I don't like that description at all for something I need a totally different description. And now we're getting really messy. The, the, this is why I, I keep uh, saying don't edit don't change data structure, you, you need to have edit operations, right? There's this huge uh, trend uh, in computer science to go towards what is known as event sourcing. It's recording the change events and having a log, uh, 
uh, flux of change events instead of having the structure. Mm -hmm. Because when you have the structure, you have coordination problems about, I make this edit, you make this edit, which one wins or should one win? And uh, can, can we discuss and compare the two states before and after the event? If all we're working with is a structure, it's difficult. If we have change events, well, what, what do you think of this modification? If we can express it as a modification, it's a totally different conversation. Mm -hmm. And even there, there's another trend is uh, forget the event streaming because streaming is even a linear order what you have is change events, which may or may not be in succession, may or may not be uh, interchangeable, that's operational transform, or order independent, that's CRDT, or cause, somewhat causally related. And I think this notion that, uh, well, this event, this change event relies on this change event having been there, and doesn't care about this one. So we can reconstruct, again, the state from dependencies between change event without thinking too hard about the sequence is, I think, a very strong intuition. Uh, but that means thinking about operations rather than state. And that's a big paradigm shift for programming. You know, one approach to that that I think is conceptually uh, whether you know the execution of this is obviously a huge challenge but if you have one um note thing link you know file um to which um at its original source say let's say it's a a link to an article on a site um, and it's got some metadata about when it was originally published and and you know it's got an image attached to it and all these things additional annotations tags relationships to other things are added by other people under their you know digital signature Identity. Yeah. Um, other either just for themselves or for their own groups like you know we're we're taking this and in this context we're tagging this this way and we're not making this information public publicly available that's you know an obvious use case but you know willingness to make that information available broadly is something that someone could opt into but for the other consumers of that um, piece of information they could be saying i want to only deal with the original um, original metadata of this object or i want to include the metadata from all of the people in the network that I belong to that is available to me, or I want to only include metadata added by Marc Antoine because like, I'm really interested in his take on this object and, and he's made it, or we're collaborating um, and he's made that, um, that metadata available to me. And so there are all kinds of ways of then being able to, to weight representation um, in ways like, okay, here was this original object. Um, how many people, uh, how many people tag this as misinformation or disinformation um, and are those people, how many people in my network um, classified it as misinformation or disinformation? So that there are ways of um, just using, not, not, not saying in any linear way, these changes have been made to the original object, but rather these attributes have been attached to this object by these authors and 
the the weight that I as a viewer give those things, um, th those attachments is a choice I can make um, and you know might be made at a, at a group level rather than an individual level for, for purposes that you know a group is, is trying to do something um, and wants the stuff that you know that that uh, you know climate change experts who have actual degrees have tagged relevant or important as a and you know not, thereby masking out the fact that a bunch of climate skeptics have tagged it as disinformation because you're not interested in what climate skeptics think of this thing, or you're not wanting to use that filmer, that, that filter. Um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm meandering, but, the, but the, the key thought is that, that metadata tags primarily in a way that are attached by people to an object are a filterable thing. And that's that's a that's a mechanic that I think we want to be able to um, view in different ways and 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 make you know make a part of of basic information that can be viewed on different platforms and in different representations. That's absolutely true, and there are projects in that direction. I'm trying to remember the name of one important one that. I saw people getting excited about the overweb, I think, was very much an attempt to do this. Uh, I've been a bit underwhelmed by the overweb and specifically for other reasons, but uh, there's certainly the notion of collective tagging and collective, that works. I mean, it's what made, for example, um, delicious, wonderful, while it was used. It's uh delicious was one of the real good experiments in collective intelligence it still has limits and uh, you know i'm trying to dig into the limits but i'm afraid also of filtering that way also enables the echo chamber right because it's also possible to uh say okay i just trust you know uh, Fox News and Breitbart and this and that, and 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 I am quite worried about the uh, ability to erase uh, parts of the argument with filtering, and and that's why it's so important for me that any curated map, and I believe strongly in the value of curated maps, and that a curated map does erasure is perfectly legitimate, but that always to be able to. Uh, at, in one click say, okay, how does this curated map look like when embedded in the global conversation? Uh, because I want the uh, confrontation with the broader discourse to always be available, to avoid the information bubble uh, dynamic that we see at play now. You know, I, it's funny, I was, I was, um listening to a bunch of uh, Eli Paris or podcasts last night, um, just, you know, kind of going through the filter bubble, you know, concept and, and, and how it's questioned by different people. And one thing that I didn't feel was, was properly dealt with, and I'm very curious about is when you're talking about an algorithmically imposed filter bubble, you're talking about a way in which people are not really aware of the way the information they receive is being, being filtered. And that, you know, proactively, um, I feel like people Obviously, there are people who watch Fox News, and obviously there are people who watch MSNBC, and you know whatever. Um, and there are people who get their news here and there. Um, but for the vast 
I, I won't even call it middle, but you know, just the the typical reasonably knowledgeable, admittedly partisan person. Um, the 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 desire, if asked to say, if you know somebody says, well, this isn't the mythical centrist unicorn. I'm talking about everybody from everybody who's not an extremist, you know, um, and not like determined to say, I don't want to hear any information that disagrees with mine, which is not a thing that most people would overtly say. They might end up doing it. Well, I mean, everybody wants to think they're reasonably understanding and like they get, they have a picture of the way somebody else thinks. Um, and I think requiring people to, to set their own filters on information on different subjects and whether they want to include or disclude particular um, particular sources is a very, very useful tool for keeping, you know, the, the, the generalized filter bubbles that exist that are algorithmically imposed are, well, if you like uh, reposted that thing that your friend got from Breitbart, then we're going to make the choice for you of not showing you stuff from the New York Times where you're not like if you don't saying... mind Michael. sorry yeah I'm sorry to cut you off I, I wouldn't normally do that okay. I just have to, I have to leave in a minute or two and I just want to get a thought out um, before I have to go because this is amazing I I what I heard you saying was make you know it will at the very least providing people with an option to go outside the bubble that they just created with all their filters, right? And seeing what else is being talked about, putting it in context of the larger conversations that was the way Marc Antoine was just saying it. And I saw you saying more than that, even like, like how do we make sure that people don't create such a thick wall that they never see, you know, they're never introduced to other things. And for me, it's less about it. it this involves two conversations. And then I think we'll have to, I'll have to leave it there, which is how the, that you touched on, how, where's the source of the information that I'm getting, right? Does it have a unique source or is the source is just someone lied and everybody's referring to the person who's lying right? like, and it makes it sound like it's real because a hundred people just, just repeated what was said, right? So source matters. And then um, also to me, this is where the design can come in again to help provide some foundational element in, the, in, in understanding and giving something contextual meaning uh, potentially where the connectors between things could, could offer up. These are opposing views. It could be red, it could be arrows faced to each other. I mean, it could, whatever, right? Because sometimes it's not just about fake news. Maybe it's an emerging new piece of science that's not currently accepted in the mainstream. Again, is gonna seem like this weird thing that's sitting out on the edge that no one really agrees with yet, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's not right for conversation. So I think there are ways to neutralize the, the judgment. You can, everyone can cast their own personal judgment, right? But try to bring disagreeing points of view, disagreeing pieces of information. Um, is light a wave or is it a you know particle, right? Like there was an argument there for a very long time it and it turns out it's both, right? So you, it's that kind of thing, it, whether we're talking about science, we're talking about facts, we're talking about news, it all comes through a filter of our person and our society and our beliefs and all that stuff. And there needs to be a place where these things can exist together and yet have some representation that they're not all equal things. And, and, I, and I think I agree. And I think that the way that if you're looking at things that are, are tagged a multiplicity of different ways, um, take it from the idea of like, you're doing a Google search. You don't put the, um, you don't put the constraints on it first. If this stuff comes up and you could see that it was tagged a lot of different ways by a lot of different people, but then go into that tag um, and, and say, the people who tagged it disinformation were these, 
these people who I do or don't agree with, that's a point of information that says, you know, this is where the argument is. And, and most things are not going to be that partisan and extreme. It's just you're going to be most of the things that you're dealing with are going to be like, you know, I'm interested in some place to eat. And, you know, I care more about what people who are vegans think because I'm a vegan than I do about people who are carnivores, you know, whatever. I mean, and, and lots of lots of information, you want to be able to look at who tagged it what and and you know, customize your filter to the, the situation you're in. And it's less about if you're dealing, I mean, this all comes back to business models of information gathering. If you're not on a platform that is optimizing to use your attention and sell it, then you're wanting to get to the piece of information that you need as quickly as possible. You're not in a lie back and consume mode where stuff is flying at you and that makes a huge difference that you know helps you not be sucked into filter bubbles thank you for the uh, the example of vegan veganism as a legitimate filter bubble <laughs> i think it's absolutely valid and uh, the um yeah my I, I, since i'm more interested in the political my my take is making the arguments very explicit. Like when you, uh, when I say embedded, something is embedded. Okay, here are the reasons. Why is this disinformation? Because here's the counter evidence. And, and, and what I found in a lot of uh, the trolling matches in um, around climate change, for example, is that the the climate change denialists have some excellent arguments, but these arguments have been debunked and the debunking is not at rest. So if you look at the uh, argument structure depth, it's a depth one answer. <laughs> and, and, and for me, this is actually the reason I'm, or depth two, but not depth three, right? There's there's the, the, the argument, the counter argument, and no counter counter argument. And this is really what's key in my, you know, I'm not a climate scientist. I mean, there's reasons why the arguments of uh, climate scientists make sense to me, but I heard counter arguments that in the face of it could be believable from my layman's understanding of, uh, climate science and then and then you look at the argument structure and you see a hey. <laughs> now and now I've read enough that I can start debunking it myself but that came later that came later right um, but but seeing the argument structure is extremely important seeing has this been debunked and has or and or has the debunking been debunked Okay, folks, I think it's as good a time to close as any, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I have to run too. And, and, and yes, Vincent, love, love, loving the, the, the mind map as we go. Um, and and thank, I don't know if you just shared it. I saw you doing something. So thanks for, for that, I, if you're sharing. I might have to, uh, I might have to actually, I think it'll be worth it, but I think I'm going to buy the premium version of this app. It's called Concept, and the premium version lets you export it in like lots of different formats and like much higher quality. And it's also worth it. Makes it collaborative. I just started using it yesterday, and I figured I would try it out today during our meeting, and I like love it so far. So, uh, Concept Concepts is a beautiful app. It's hmm. I think it yeah. is the best. Uh, kind of the mix of freehand and structure that it allows. Yeah. It's really sharp. Oh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm going to post that in the, uh, in the Mattermost as soon as I cool my iPad. Ciao, ciao. Thanks. Good to see you all. See ya.